There is something very special about hearing a train whistle and seeing the caravan of boxcars weave their way through the Appalachian mountainside. It reminds me of many of the people of Appalachia, hard-working coal miners and their families struggling to make ends meet, and whose livelihood depends in part on these trains. Hi, I'm Dante Thompson. For more than three decades, my mother, Joanne Thompson, traveled these mountains to bring help and to share the love of Jesus to the people of Appalachia. I guess you could say her journey is much like that of these trains, going steadily down the track, never knowing what's around the next turn. She traveled the windy roads, never knowing who she would meet next or the stories she would hear. Join us as we take a look back at the touching stories of families living in this region and the many decades of ministry that have taken place in Appalachia, right here at the crossroads. As far as I can remember, Christmas time meant a trip to the hills of Appalachia, bringing jackets, shoes, blankets, and toys for the people of the hills, all donated by you, the viewers of Dope Broadcasting. I think it's fitting that my mother shared in her own words what this project meant to her and her ministry. The first time I met the Parson of the Hills was on Channel 16, really. I was at home watching the program, and I didn't know that the Parson of the Hill would really have that much of an influence on my life that night. But I began to listen to him sharing about the little children in the Appalachian Hills. And my heart was touched, and God began to speak to me, and I'd been walking around in the den and doing my work, and, but I felt impressed to sit down and take a, a real listen to what the parson was saying. And he was telling about all the little needy children in the mountains of Appalachian, and he took Christmas to them every year, and he was sharing with, uh, with uh, I believe Jimmy was host that night, he was sharing with him about how that the children would walk for miles just to get a little toy. Many of them in the snow without any shoes on. Many of them didn't have clothes to wear, the, uh, no warm coats or anything. And in my mind, I could see those little children standing there, children that were numb with cold, shivering, waiting for the spiritual Santa Claus, uh, the parson of the hills, to come by. And he says, you know, I've got Christmas coming up this time, and says, I haven't gotten, got anything to take to these children. He told us about the old people, too, that would ask for just one stick of peppermint candy for Christmas. And this touched my heart. And so I didn't know what I could do. I had not been thinking too much about Christmas. I thought that I would spend uh, more time at home and more time with my family this year, but God had other plans. And I began to think of what I could do to, to help him. The Parson of the Hills has given his life to these people, these people of the Appalachians. I really didn't know what God had in store for those children. I didn't know what God had in store for me, but I was willing to take a step of faith, and I did. I called him, and I told him, I said, can I go with you on your trip this Christmas into the Appalachian? And he said, well, sure you can. And I said, I want to help you. I want to help you get things to take. And he said, how much do you want to take? I said, I don't know. But I said, God has definitely laid it on my heart that I need to go with you and I just want to be a blessing. I want to be used to the Lord, and, and we'll get it all together. And you know what he said? I want you to go. And after that, it was just as if God had come on the scene, and it, it began to go together, just like a jigsaw puzzle. The pieces began to fit. We uh, had one big truck, one big great big truck. Uh, it began to fill up as I expressed the need on Channel 16 and people began to bring warm clothes in. And 
one lady I remember even brought clothes in and uh, coats, jackets of all size, warm, warm coats. And she would even pin some mittens to match and a little cap and a toboggan. Just beautiful things, first class things all the way. And they were bringing in toys. They were bringing in all kind of things. A uh, food, and a lot of people brought in money. And the, the trucks just began to get fuller and fuller. It was really amazing and beautiful to watch these people pull up in station wagons and big trucks themselves and unload. And they'd say, I collected all this for the children of the Appalachian. Will you take it with, with you? And oh, we were welcoming it with open arms. God began putting it all together. It was beautiful to see the trucks going down the road and to just say, God, there goes Christmas for so many children. There goes Christmas for a lot of senior citizens that's going to be standing out by the road. And this will be the only Christmas they, they have. It was just beautiful to just have a, a, a thankful heart that God is everywhere at Christmas and other times too, but he works through people. I was raised in a cabin in the hills. I know what it means to not get nothing for Christmas. I know what it means to wear shoes with bottoms out. I know what it means to be sick and no one to help me. But today God has put into my heart a great big a great big love for everybody. And I am here today to exalt, magnify, and illuminate the greatest name that's ever been given to the human race. It's Jesus of Nazareth. That little baby born in Bethlehem many centuries ago came in this world to show us the way to eternal life. And the gift of God is the greatest gift you can receive this Christmas if you don't know Jesus. Amen. It's, all, it's good to receive to toys, baby dolls, oranges, and all of that. But the greatest gift today is the gift of salvation that was brought down from Almighty God through His Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. And I pray today, as some of you sitting here today may never see another Christmas. This may be your last Christmas, but how is it with your soul? Are you ready to meet God? Folks of Appalachia, call Him the Parson of the Hill. He comes and shares the burden while praying for their ills. In the hills of North Carolina, you'll find him on his knees. And there you'll hear the story of the Reverend Charlie King. Almost 50 years ago, he hit the mountain roads, preaching about salvation, many seeds. Charlie found that hungry folks don't listen like they should So he filled his truck with things to eat and all the clothes he could Folks of Appalachia call him the parson of the hills He comes and shares a burden while praying for their ills In the hills of North Carolina you'll find him on his knees there you'll hear the story of the Reverend Charlie Key. In the foreword of his book, Reverend Key states, I have been persecuted and punished almost beyond endurance, but God has always delivered me. I have been before the law many times for preaching the truth, but I have always been set free. My sacrifices have been great, but God has been by my side. Why does he continue this work year after year? What is his aim? What does he expect to gain from it all? My hope for the future, uh, the horizon is, is far yonder. I, as far as I can look, I can see tens of thousands of young people that I'm yet to approach to bring uh, training to. And uh, there's so many things that I want to do a lot of the young people that have come up under my ministry are today ministers. Many of them have gone to college, and uh, I feel that I'm doing a work that, uh, that is worthwhile. Uh, I feel like that uh, the future uh, out yonder has a great prospects in this work. 
So as long as I can impart into the minds of the young people something that will better their lives and cause those young people uh, to go out uh, in society and, and, and help others, I feel that I have actually accomplished something uh, that you cannot compare with materialistic things. And the parson has been in this work for so long that he's tired in body, but not spirit. Tell me about some of the, your experiences with the Lord back in the mountains when it was just you and the Lord. How did God speak to you as a child so that you could understand? Well, he, is, he spoke to me uh, in a way that's unbelievable. You know, the Bible says, one, this one, one scripture says, I, I, I've chosen you. And, and God, I feel, ha had his hand on me from a little boy from now. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would experience uh, God working with, uh, working with me in the mountains. Uh, I'd go in the mountain and, and preach on tree stumps all day long. How did you know what to say? Well, the, my grandmother taught me the scriptures. And I'd, I'd quote the scriptures what my grandmother taught me. Now, who was your congregation back there in the woods? Rabbits and squirrels and anything uh, that cre uh, they want to stay around with. Just any creatures? Yeah, and they stay there too. I believe sometimes you had chickens, didn't you? Yeah, I, I preach to chickens. Tell me how about your chicken sermons. Well, I'd have a revival with Dominecker hens and roosters. <laughs> and my daddy's chicken lot, he, he bought chickens from mountain people. Mm -hmm. And I'd stand on the egg crate and, and preach to their old hens and roosters. Did they listen? <laughs> Did they stay still? Oh, like if I had <laughs> some corn. Oh. I, I, I I, you bribed them, in other words. I, I <laughs> <laughs> but you were still giving. You were giving something uh, even at four and five years old. God it was training me. Yeah. Now, how did you get started in, in, in these homes? How did you know where there was a need at six years old, just a little boy? Well, I, I, get, I was informed about the need by my friends. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, I would go to home and, and inquire about the needs and let the people know that someone was interested in, 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 the, in, in the, their welfare. Would you go in the homes of people you didn't even know? Yes, I, many a home. And they'd invite you in? Yeah. And what would you tell them why the reason that you came? I told my, I, I, I was there to represent Jesus Christ and to have prayer with them. And if, they're a, if they have a need, I, I, I try to help me. At six me. years old? Yeah. And nobody went with you? I had a schoolmate that went with me and helped me. What was his name? A Jones boy. And he helped me carry the toboggan, I mean the, the tow sack that okay. was full of goodies. Did you have prayer with him? Yeah, I'd always pray. At six years old? Yeah, and God would touch their hearts. God to touch their hearts, and uh, many of old mountain near would break down and cry through because my a prayers. Child. Yeah. Mm. The Bible says a little child shall lead them. It's Christmas time now, and you're seven or eight years old. Would you take those people that needed something for Christmas? I took Grandma peppermint candy, big stick candy, and uh, the Where'd kids. Where'd you get it? Uh, I sold peanuts on the street, West Jefferson, and g used my peanut money. Yeah. To buy candy? Yeah. For them? What'd you carry it in? A little red, red wagon. You pulled it up to these old mountaineer homes? Yeah, with my assistant, the old Jones boy, helped me. Yeah. Pulling it in a little red wagon at seven or eight years old? Yeah. What do people say about you in the community? 
They, they said I was the most unusual boy they ever seen. But you began your ministry at that yeah, time? Yeah, at that time, and I've been going out ever since. I haven't stopped. Why did you feel such a pull and a calling to mountain people? I felt like that, that was my calling. And uh, I seen so much poverty and hunger in the hills. And I said, well, oh, oh God, use me in an unusual way, in an unusual way mm -hmm. to minister to these people, uh, my people. Reliving your life, what would you change? Nothing. Yeah, but Parson, it's been hard. It's been hard doing what you do. I know, it's sacrificial. Wouldn't you go back and change just a little bit? How could I? Because everything that I would change would be beneficial to the child. Yeah, but you have traveled these mountain trails for many years. You and gotta I, get tired. I, I get awful tired. This is your ministry, isn't it? Yeah. This is your love. I wouldn't have nothing else. As long as I can help a little child, I, I'm a whole heart's in it. It's to help another little child. We don't know what God's got in the future. No, no we, we know that this is ministry's got to go on, though. No. You wouldn't want it to stop with you? No. How would you like to see it go? In what direction? Would you want your uh, Christmas parties to go a different route? No, I, would, uh, I want to go just like I've been going. Not letting up? No, not letting up one bit. Reverend Swink, what about this crowd today? This is one of the largest we've had in several years and one of the most needed, I do believe. I saw people coming through this line that weren't here just to, you know, just to pass the time. Right. They had needs. Right. And I talked with many people that said, this is the only Christmas my kids will get. And that is true. Yeah. What's going to happen in the future? I think this ministry is going to get bigger. I think it's going to get better. I think we're going to serve more people. I got that feeling. You talked about today, I noticed, uh, about the hard times. And every ministry has the hard times. That's right. Without it, we wouldn't, we wouldn't know what the good times are. That's true. Are. That's true. But I think that his ministry, the Parson of the Hills ministry, is far reaching more than he could ever imagine. He doesn't realize, does he? That's right. Uh, we're at a peak now, and of course, Reverend Keyes is, is very feeble. Yes. He's very weak. Mm -hmm. Many things he can't remember. Mm -hmm. And uh, when he sees this crowd, he just breaks down and starts crying. This is what he's visualized for years. Yeah. Reaching the masses of people, especially little children and old aged folks. But he's seen that dream come true. That's right. And what do, what do you think is going to happen in the future? Are the crowds going to get bigger? I think they're going to get bigger. And if we use this place again here, of course, we turned away. We don't know how many today. Lots. And the police have had a problem with traffic mm -hmm. for a couple of miles in either direction. Yeah. And we had to lock the gate. Our bleachers were full on either side. And Judy told me just a moment ago uh, the figures that she had, almost 3,500 children that we sent tickets and letters to. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, she come up with uh, 4,608 people in the building. So we are reaching for the 5,000 mark. Right. In one party. Right. It's a lot of people. We feel it in our bodies, too, don't we? Oh, yes, yes. I'm so tired, tired, I don't even want to stand. That's right. But God blessed. And did you see those people give their heart to Jesus? Right. I counted 72 that responded, and then there was others. Mm -hmm. And there was a number of them that just stood and wept. Mm -hmm. 
God was here. Right. And I think he's pleased with the party today. I, I think so. And the, uh, the needs for the bigger parties is coming all the time. Mm -hmm. We're being supplied yes. with uh, a lot of good stuff. And from Channel 16, we have got the goods. Yeah. And I hope that we can get them out. Yes. And I believe you can. I believe God so. God bless you. Bless we you too. We love you and appreciate you. We love you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this man. God, you had his work cut out for him before he was even born. Yes. And you've had your hand on him all these years. And you've blessed him and you've used him. God only knows how great his work has truly been. But God, we know that this year that you're going to use him even greater. May it be the most gracious Christmas for him. Amen. And in his heart, may he feel like, God, he's accomplished so much. Give him a day of rejoicing, God, that yes. he's done his best. He's given his best to Jesus. Yes. And Lord, help him know that this work is going on and he's going to be the one that's going to spearhead it and that you're going to use him even greater for those little kids are still going to look for the parson of the hills. And don't let, me, don't let me miss them, one of them, one little baby. Not one, God. Don't let me miss one of them. Amen. Praise God. And let the need be met. It will be, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. I didn't dream that this would ever grow into like this. I mean, I thought it would always stay small and uh, I would help uh, uh, the Parson of the Hills and that would be it. But you know, when God opens a door and you go through that door, you never know when, what's on the other end of the line. And when he took the Parson to heaven and Reverend Swink to heaven, I was thinking maybe he'd take me too or either I could move off this project since they instigated it and I wanted some rest. But you know what? God doesn't, he doesn't work that way. And his ways are so much higher than ours. And so one night I was praying, I was just saying, God, I've really enjoyed working with these people and uh, we've done a good work for you and we're proud and uh, I'm, I'm hoping somebody else will do something. And God spoke to me and said, what do you think I've been training you 15 years for? And I got to thinking, well, I guess I got that message. And so here I am years later. The parson would be so happy to see how it's grown. In December 2009, my mother, Joanne Thompson, made her final trip to the hills of Appalachia. Though her physical health wasn't strong, her desire to share Jesus with the children of the hills was as strong as ever. We always like taking groceries to the families, and that requires a shopping trip. My mother had to have a little help her last trip, not only getting around the store, but also buying so many groceries for the families. She sat down with Joe and Timmy Mitchell to hear their story. How, how are things in the mountains now? Is it hard? Mm, it's hard if you want it to be hard. Now, what do you mean by that? If you come up and if things don't, you know, get too hard, if you don't pick yourself up and go go on with it and everything, it'll just drag you down real bad. But the Lord blesses us and strengthens us to where we can come up and survive through the mountains. Did you finish high school? No, I quit in ninth. You quit in what? Ninth grade. You know, mo more people quit in the ninth grade. <laughs> and I wonder why. I was having it rough and everything. I had abusive life with my dad and stuff, and but 
we got we worked those problems out when he got sick. We talked and we made, uh, which I forgave him when I got older because I know that he had a rough life and it was hard on him trying to take care of us and have jobs and stuff. So, did alcohol enter the problem? Yeah, that's what his problem was. Alcohol. Uh, he died recently. Yeah. He died June the fifth of this year. Oh. What was his life like before the end? Did he ask Jesus to forgive him? Yeah, he gave his life to the Lord, thank God. You mm -hmm. want him to the Lord? Yeah. Well, that's great. Me that's... and my family and my mom's preacher and him, we talked to him and everything, and he gave us four months of the best memories we can ever have. That's good. No regrets. No Those... regrets. That's great. Now, Joseph. How are you? I hear that you went to school with this lady, but uh, you never noticed her in the early years, did you? No. Back in the... What was wrong with her? Well, really not. Wasn't nothing. wild enough. <laughs> wasn't it's... wild enough? No, nah, I, was, I was pretty wild when I was in school. Um, what were you doing? Smoking weed. Smoking weed. I've, I've always been a pot here. I, I smoke all kinds of weed. I stay stoned. I was messed up. And I smoke so much of it that I get up at morning time, fire me one up. I used to ride horses and saddle my horse up and take off. And I'd smoke weed all day long. Then you get back. tired of that life. Well, that was the only life I... I chose at that time. My mother passed away, and that was the only comfort that I found. The only way I could deal with it. And before she passed away, it was just, I don't know, like 20 joints a month is all I would smoke. And then after she passed away, it was 50 and 100, $200 a day. I started smoking. But how did you get that money to buy that much? Well, I go to work. Oh, you could still work? I still Stoned? work. Stoned? Stoned down my mind, still work. I shoot horses. Anything I want to do, I go trade. I do whatever I want to do and just keep on go do it. Where'd you get all those tattoos? Well, uh, I see. Doesn't that hurt? No. I was stoned when I got most of these. Yeah. I said, I want a tattoo. I got stoned, woke up. I had this one. I got a great begging on my back. I got a begging on this I'd other side. I have to be really stoned to and get that first needle. I got them up through here. And then I, uh, I got them up through here. Uh, uh. Then I got them begging on my back. Uh, but then, you're stuck with them. Yeah, you can't never get rid of them. Yeah. Okay, tell me about Jesus. I don't think he has tattoos. Do you? But I No, think, but I don't think he, he I, judges me for this. No, he doesn't. No. No. Because when I die, this right here is going back to it's the dirt. It's gone. It's going back to ashes. You're it, right. it ain't going to be. This, well, I'm not me, taking this to that's heaven. That's right. He doesn't even see those. No. Okay, tell me about the day or night that you found Jesus. <coughs> okay, I'm sitting right there where you at. This chair. Well, in that other chair over oh, yeah. yonder, but that okay. chair was sitting where you're at. I was watching this TV right here. It was about 5.30 in the morning. Good night. I had a 20-gauge shotgun hanging on the wall. Me and her had been arguing and fighting, carrying on. Yeah. Not fist fighting, nothing like that. Yeah. And I thought about just ending it. The shotgun was calling. Boy, boy, I looked at that. The worse it, the, it got. Yeah, come on, go ahead, do it. Well, I was just flipping through the channels, and this little preacher from Arkansas was on there reading about the Bible. With um, he he would read it and explain verse by verse, and he got down on the Ten Commandments. Thou oh. shalt not kill, shalt not lie, all right. you, you know, all the Ten Commandments. And by the time his hour was up, 
I was crying and feeling good. So that day, that morning, I asked the Lord to come into my life then. Now, she didn't know this. Yeah. It was like, what, a month, month and a half passed. And I told her, I said, we're going to go to church. Out of the blue, you said this? Every morning she get up. Were you shocked? Yeah, <coughs> I was. Every morning she'd wake up, I'd be sitting right there watching that little preacher. <coughs> it's been different, t uh, Tammy. Tammy. It's been wonderful. Getting rid of St. Nellamore life has been the best decision we made, bringing the Lord into it. That's great. That's great. Now, smoking the weed. Yeah, I want to know what happened to that. Brother Jack and his little <laughs> group that he was running with, I guess they was praying on me on that. Before I gave myself to the Lord and the Lord come and got a hold of me, I quit that about a year before the Lord got me. Okay. Now I just quit cold turkey. I had, I could feel your little black bag up there. there. I burnt pot pipes, dope, scales, everything I had. I just burned it all up. You gave it all, didn't you? I burned it all up and I said, I ain't doing it no more. And I just quit. Well, what about some of your friends? Have you told them about this experience? My friends, I ain't got no. You don't have any friends? I got one friend, and that's Jesus Christ. Well, that's really all you need. Yeah. Now, before I stepped up and Jesus come into my life, and I was smoking weed, and I hear trading horses and guns and just doing all kinds of wild stuff, I couldn't lay down and go to sleep. 11, 12 o'clock until people was leaving, wanting to trade, do this, do that. And then after I quit and the Lord come into my life, the only thing that comes here is preachers. <laughs> the only, only thing that comes here. Your friends dropped you then. They dropped me like cold That's turkey. That's okay. And, but I enjoy that. Yeah. I yeah. like it because they weren't my friends to start with. No, before That's I, true. Before I met them, they was nothing to me. And now, since they're gone, I wish they'd get the Lord in their life. Yeah. I would love to be with them in heaven. But if not, if they go to hell, that's their business. That, well, not yeah. mine. No. I'm not going to beg them. And the you're Lord. not going with them? No, I'm not going with them. <laughs> I'll run over top of them. That's good. That's to good. To get to heaven. You read your Bible? No, nope. can't read a lick. You That's what? why I sit right on in that chair and watch it on TV. I can't read. You can't read? I never learned. What a shame. I never learned. But well, you, I know you, a lot about the Lord. Do you read to him? Most of the time, if he wants me to read a verse, look up something, uh -huh. I'll look it up. But a lot of times, he wants to try to learn on his own. He'll listen to the TV and he'll listen to preachers and other Christians and try to talk. follow along in the yeah. Bible. Well, do you go to church now? Yeah. And you're getting better every day? I feel good every morning I wake up. That's good. Every you got a new day. husband, mm -hmm. hadn't you? Got a new life, and it's great. And only God could do that. And only God. Yeah. Good to meet you. It's good to meet you. And your little girl, who uh, is rich, she has a dollar bill. <laughs> uh, tell me about you. How old are you? Nineteen. You look like you'll be twelve or thirteen. Today's my birthday. I turned nineteen today. Nineteen today. Well, happy birthday to you. Thank you. Is this your house? 
Yes. You live by yourself? Me and him and her. Uh-huh. Your little girl? Mm hmm Is that your boyfriend? Yes. Is it serious? Yeah, we've been together for five years. Five years? Five years. Wow. What, what would you like to do with your life? You're so young. I want to go back to school, finish my GED, and become an LPN. Honey, what's your name? Tell me your name. What's your what name? What is your name? Tina. Tina. Her name is just Tina. But... Okay. All right, how old are you? So I'll be three next month. Oh, you are then almost you three. Do you go to church, uh, Brittany? Um, I used to. I don't anymore. What, what happened? My grandmother died, and I don't go to the church anymore. I want to, but I just don't want to go to the same church. It just brings back to me memories. Well, you don't have to go to the same one, do you? No, but that's the closest one around here, mm -hmm. walking distance. But listen, was your grandmother a Christian? Yes. Well, then you want to meet her someday, don't you? Yep. Okay. Then you need to go to church. Have you asked Jesus in your heart? No, not yet. Not yet? What are you waiting on? I don't know. I really want to get back in church, though. Well, church won't save you, though. I know. I I to. And you need to have her in Sunday school. You really do. Would you like to ask Jesus back in your heart or in your heart? Yeah. It'd be the perfect time. Yeah. Uh, wouldn't you, have you ever asked Jesus in no. your heart? Never ask him. Have you ever been to church? No, a little. Well, if she started going, would you go? Yeah. yeah. See there? <laughs> okay. Well, listen, there's no better time than Christmas time to ask Jesus in your heart, because really, it's his birthday. Yeah. It's yeah. when he was born. Yeah. If I prayed for both of you, and you held hands, would you both ask Jesus in your heart? Yeah. Travis, would you? Yeah. Okay, hold her hand. I don't know where the hands are, <laughs> okay? All right. Okay. De Dear, Jesus, Dear Jesus. Dear Jesus. I don't know much about you. I don't, I don't know, know much, much about, about you. you. But I believe you died for my sins. But I believe, I believe you, you died, died for my, my sins. sins. On the cross. On the cross. On the cross. You shed your blood for me. You shed, shed your, blood your blood for me. me. I want to be a good mommy. I want to be a good mommy. To my little girl. To my little girl. And I want to be a good wife when Travis and I get married. I want to be a good wife when me and Travis get married. And Travis, I want to be a good husband. I want to be a good husband. Okay, when we get married. When we get married. Okay. I, I accept you as my savior. I accept, I accept you, you as, as my, my savior. savior. I want to start going to church. I want to start going to church. church. And reading the Bible. And reading the Bible. And bring the, our little girl up like she should be. And bring, bring your little, little girl, girl up like she should, should be. be. Thank you for saving me tonight. Thank, Thank you for you saving, saving me tonight. Me. And give me a home in heaven. And give me a home in heaven. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Kermit and Casey Walker have had their share of struggles and even had to live in their car at one period because things got so bad. Casey was diagnosed with glaucoma at a young age and she suffered a lot of ridicule from students at school and from her family. I'm uh, Kermit Walker III. Yeah, this is my son, Kermit Walker IV, fourth generation. It's 
my wife Casey Walker, my daughter Amanda. Just turned a year old tonight. One. And they, they said I might not be able to see by the time I'm 30. And then some days it's all right and some days it's just really bad. And even with medicine, I'm like, like somebody just took a picture of, 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 of you right in your eye. With a, with a flash camera, mm -hmm. and I can't be around bright lights because it because I have a lens that they had to take out. They had to take my, out my original lens and put one of those fake ones in, and daylight messes with me, and bright lights mess with me. Oh bless you! Yeah, you, know, you know how like when you, when you squint, you see all those little light rays. Yeah. That's how it is if I walk out in the sun. He doesn't have glaucoma, but he has got uh, really, really badly nearsighted. Yeah. Uh, we started both children very early checking for glaucoma, though, because we're, their see, mother has because it. because every time you take off my glasses, <laughs> I cannot see. Would you like to pray and ask Jesus to help you and make you stronger? Sure. Okay. Say, repeat after me and mean it in your heart. Okay. okay. Dear Jesus. Dear Jesus. I want to come back to you. I want to come back to you. And be a strong Christian. Be a strong Christian. I want to be the kind that you want. I want to be the kind that you want. And even though I can't see like I'd like to, and even though I can't see like I'd like to. I am praying. I am praying. That you will give me my sight. That you will give me my sight. Spiritually and physically. Spiritually and physically. I want to serve you. I want to serve you. The best of my ability. My best ability. Help me with my children. Help me with my children. And help me daily. And help me daily. And I, I want to come to heaven when I die. I want to come to heaven when I die. Because I've been through enough hell down here. Because I've been through enough hell down here. In Jesus' name. Amen. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Welch, West Virginia was the location for our annual Appalachian Christmas party where thousands of people from around the area would come together. We filled a high school gymnasium with toys, stuffed animals, blankets, school supplies, treat bags, and clothing to help meet the needs of so many families. A local bluegrass band, South 52, led the Christmas music. I'm so glad that you didn't let the weather keep you at home. Even though it's raining and it's dreary, dreary outside, the crowd is looking better and better. And we're glad to bring Christmas to you. But I want to ask you one question. Do you know whose birthday Christmas really is? Jesus! Oh, that's right, Jesus. And we should never forget that because he loves you very, very much, so much that he gave his life for you. And that's how you get to heaven. How many of you people want to go to heaven when you die? How many don't want to go to heaven when you die? Oh, I see. That's right, heaven is a wonderful place, but there's only one way to get there, and that is to accept Jesus in your heart. I'd like for you to be very still now because I'm not going to talk for just a few minutes. We brought all these toys. They're absolutely free to you.
because we wanted to show the love of Jesus. Jesus couldn't come down from heaven. He could have, but he didn't. But he sent us to bring them for him, but they are from him. How many of you have never heard of Jesus? Raise your hand. There's a few hands. How many of you would like to take Jesus into your heart this very afternoon? You'd like to make your life a lot better. And with Jesus, you can do that. If home is not what you want it to be, if Jesus is in there, he changes everything. Every, every head bowed, every eye closed, no moving around, no talking. How many of you would like to take the real meaning of Christmas, Jesus Christ, into your heart? Raise your hand. The, how many of you have never been saved, but you want to raise your hand and accept Jesus now? Okay, I see some hands. All right, that's good. If you raised your hand, I want you to stand up right where you are. Stand up right where you are if you want to pray the sinner's prayer and accept Jesus in your heart, okay? Every eye closed, nobody talking. This is the best part of the, of the program today is people accepting Jesus. Now, I want you to repeat after me. Dear Jesus, would you come into my heart and save me from all my sins? Thank you for Christmas. And thank you for dying on the cross for me. And I want to live for you. How many of you prayed that prayer and you, you accepted Jesus? A lot of hands. A lot of hands. Now, how many of you will find a church in your local area and go to that church? Will you do that? Okay. They need you and you need the church because you can grow in the church and, and you can help pe other people. You can help people bring Christmas into your area because God will make, make plenty of things for you to do and plenty of things for you to bring into the church and the community. But we love you and we're so glad that you came out to have Christmas with us. God bless you all. I feel that it's important to continue this outreach each year, not only to help meet the needs with clothing and blankets, but to share Jesus with them. I feel it's important to walk through every open door to show the love of Christ because you never know what lies ahead in the upcoming year for them. Thinking of that reminded me of a remarkable lady who my mother met the year before named Melinda and her son Adam. Melinda, you have a son here that has a lot of problems. Tell me how you cope with that. Well, one day at a time, and the Lord behind me. Yeah. Have you ever asked the Lord why? Well, no, because I don't think you post questions, Lord. You know, mm -hmm. I just know he's here for a purpose. And, mm. Is he 24-7 for you? Yeah. I got to thinking how I come to the house, I said, well, it's about just like somebody being in the hospital. You mm -hmm. know, like 24 7 all the time. What does the doctor say about him? Hey, well, when he was born, they give him six months. 
And he's how old? He'll be 11 next month. Wow. Has he? Do you think he knows anything? Oh, yeah. Does yeah. he? He knows my voice, and he likes to be read, too, like books, and oh. he likes to listen to music, and, uh -huh. you know, certain toys it plays. Yeah. So when he was born, did the doctor tell you that he had problems? Did they know it at that time? Well, when he come out, you know how like a baby will squall and stuff, he just barely made a little noise. Mm -hmm. Then his doctor come back in there and he took a seizure. And they said, well, they have to take him to Lexington. Then they kept him up there probably over two weeks and they find out what's wrong with him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What did they tell you to do with him? Well, basically, take him home, make him comfortable, and take one day at a time. Does he have trouble breathing in the night? Yeah, most time I have to turn to keep his head that way. Uh-huh. Because uh, he, he starts, like, gasping from burial. Uh-huh. Yeah, I got a little small monitor in there on the side of my bed, listening to him, and it's just back as far as back as far. Bless your heart. Mm. Mm -hmm. mm. Are you a Christian? Yep. Could you have made it with all this if you had not been? What about not your husband? Is he a Christian? Mm hmm Yep. You pray with Adam? Mm-hmm. Yep. Oh, how precious. What will you give Adam for Christmas? I see he has everything he needs. <laughs> I don't want kisses. <laughs> I ain't got him nothing just yet. Well, I mean, you, he doesn't need it, does he? Mm -hmm. It don't matter. I mean, it's, well, just used to. I used to take him to trick or treat. I mean, just because the way he is. Yeah. I'm not going to let him miss out on nothing. I dress him up and take him Halloween. You know, if it wasn't too cold, if he couldn't eat the uh, ice, I mean, the candy, mm -hmm. I don't care. We'd go. If he didn't get a piece, I mean, it's just, you know, that's just the way I feel. Just because mm -hmm. the way he is, he gets toys too. If it stacks up, that's remarkable. It just stacks up. Tell me, tell the people that deal with handicapped children how you have to adjust your life. Tell them how you learn to do that. Well, I sort of really don't know myself. It's just... Yeah, but you've had 11 years of this. You just got to do what you got to do. I mean, just like I said, well, take him home, do the best you could, and they said, ain't nothing we can do. I said, well, you just know how to pray, don't you? And, you know, mm. they just looked at me like funny, so... So, well, mm. just take him home. And we took it day by day. Well, God has to give you the strength mm -hmm. to hold up to this because there's no way you yeah. could do it on your own. Mm -hmm. Well, listen, we're just going to pray that God's going to give you more strength. Mm -hmm. Is that yeah, okay? I need to. <laughs> okay. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for this precious lady who's given her life over to her son, 11 years of it. It's been a struggle. It's been hard. But I pray that you will just relieve her of this pressure and that she'll feel your presence and know that you are giving her strength to do what she knows she has to do. We know, God, that you had a son and, and you loved him as much as she loves this little boy. And I pray that you'll have your way this Christmas. May there be such peace in this house that has never been before. And we pray that you'll touch little Adam and make him as comfortable as you can. For we know you love him, and there's a purpose for his life as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I learned last year that little Adam had gone home to be with the Lord. My heart is so moved when I think about how he's not suffering anymore, and he's in heaven, meeting with my mother, Reverend Keys and Reverend Swink. It reminds me that while we are still here on earth, we must continue to work to spread the gospel of Jesus to those who are lost and to help meet the needs of those who are struggling. When Reverend Swink and Reverend Keyes passed away, my mom felt that she was to continue their work in Appalachia. Now here we are at another crossroad and I too feel we need to continue this outreach. Without you, the viewers, none of this would be possible. I want to personally thank you for standing with us for over 30 years and for all that you do to help the people of Appalachia through your prayers and your giving. God bless you for helping the people of Appalachia. 
Now I want to leave you with a prayer from my mother. Lord Jesus, we're so thankful for these precious children that you've just given us for a short moment. Father, their little lives are just right there before them. I pray that you will guide and direct these children who, who are looking to you. We pray that they're going to find joy, that they're going to find peace here. May they grow up to be people that serve and, and trust God and live for Him. Thank you for all their enthusiasm. Thank you for all their gift of love. And Father, may you go with them for the, through the rest of their life. Bless them and make them a blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.